New Thinking Allowed, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part two of our two-part series on Kabbalah and quantum physics. With me is Fred Allen Wolf, also known as Dr. Quantum. Fred is the author of numerous books, including The Body Quantum, Taking the Quantum Leap, Space Time and Beyond, The Spiritual Universe, Parallel Universes, The Dreaming Universe, Matter into Feeling, Mind into Matter, The Yoga of Time Travel, Time Loops and Space Twists, How God Created the Universe. Welcome again, Fred. Very good, Jeff. <laughs> A lot of titles to read off there. I yes. know, I know you have written so much. It's been your lifelong passion to it, make quantum physics accessible, not only to the general public, but also going a step further and looking at the relationship between quantum physics and consciousness. Yes, my driving interest has been uh, that relationship. Uh, in particular, uh, the special role that human beings play in that relationship, mm -hmm. because uh, what uh, both Kabbalah and quantum physics seem to be pointing to in their own different ways, but nor nevertheless in the same direction, is that the human being is something essential and different and important mm -hmm. in the manifestation of what we call this universe. Yes. And later on, maybe in, a, in, in our next uh, In our series about consciousness series, and space and time. We're going to be talking a little bit about space and time and <laughs> consciousness and the illusion that we call the universe and why I would use the term illusion when I myself am a hardcore quantum physicist. But that's another topic. Well, you are a hardcore quantum physicist. You've been a professor at various colleges and universities around the world. But you know you gave up your academic career in order to become an explorer of consciousness. You studied with shamans and mystics and yogis uh, everywhere, uh, and you've combined this intense pursuit of mystical awareness with your knowledge of, of modern physics. Yeah, that's been kind of the driving thing. I, 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 I think if the one thing that I have that is both a blessing and kind of maybe annoying to some others is curiosity. I always want to know, well, what is that? Why is that? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. And I'm not just satisfied with a, a purely abstract explanation. It's got to grab me in some way. Um, when I do work, even in developing equations, it's more than just the mathematics that intrigues me. It's what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of that? Uh, what does that have to do with my life, with anybody's life, with, with being a human being? Mm -hmm. uh, these are always things that intrigue me. Yeah. So uh, that's been the driving, mm -hmm. might say, force. I'm a curious being. Well, if I were to summarize how what I see is sort of the Kabbalistic relationship to uh, physics. It's something like this, that uh, Kabbalah focuses on the what we call sometimes the descent of spirit into matter, and then the ascent of matter back up to spirit. Yes, that is a wonderful insight, and that was a, the essential insight that Carlos Suarez gave me mm -hmm. when I spent time with him in Paris, uh, working with him on the uh, translation of the cipher of Genesis. Mm -hmm. He said, there is an equation here. He said, I don't know if this is really a mathematical equation, but it's got some kind of movement mm -hmm. to it. And he looked at it the following way. He said that what a human being is, is at the center of the spiritual Aleph, mm -hmm. Uh, sending a lightning bolt, which he called sheen, or the breath of God, into 
the material form, which was a sea, a water, mem, which means water, of consciousness, and that then sends back another lightning bolt, which is called sin, uh, which is the opposite of sheen, but they're the same letter, but pronounced differently. Yes. And that goes back into Aleph again. When you look at sheen and look at its spectrographic interpretation or how it looks, it's spread out. It's how diffused. the letter looks when you pronounce it, it and take a, a voice print. A voice print, a spectrographic, a special, uh, spectrographic voice print, yeah. which is gives you the frequency, the intensity, and time over which the letter is pronounced, and look to see what that looks like, and compare it with its opposite, which is seen. Same letter, but in Hebrew you have, you put dots in various places on the letter, and that tells you whether mm -hmm. it's pronounced one way or another way. Yeah. And when it's pronounced seen, it looks like a particle. So you have wave coming from Aleph, which means in interpretation, interpretation, spirit, God, mm -hmm. th the universe, manifest by giving a wave of all possibilities, manifesting into consciousness, which then delivers back to Aleph a thing, mm -hmm. a thought, a presence, an actual event. So that's the whole cycle of Aleph, Mem, Sin, Sheen, which is what uh, he thought was E equal MC squared. <laughs> and in a way, he was right. Mm -hmm. You've got E, which is the, the Aleph, and you've got M, which is the water, and C squared is the speed of light times t t multiplied by itself. So yeah. it's CC. So that's one C going one way and one C going the other way. And that, by the way, is pretty close to what is an interpretation of quantum field theory. It's amazing to me when I began to see these things that there was this tie because he knew nothing about quantum physics mm. or anything about quantum field theory or anything like that, but yet he was coming to these conclusions from a whole different side of the universe, the spiritual, mystical, all right, let's review that now. It sounds okay. pretty important. What he's suggesting, or, or maybe, maybe I'm misinterpreting, let me know if I am, the descent of matter into, excuse me, the descent of spirit into matter, and then the ascent of matter back up to spirit is equivalent somehow to E equals MC squared, which is the basis of quantum field theory. Which is, it, it, it's a very basic equation. In fact, uh, uh, we didn't realize how basic it was. I mean, when Einstein right. first came up with that idea, he had no idea. Uh, he himself didn't realize the, 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 the portent, the potency yeah. of just that idea and how it is a basis of quantum field theory. In it's fact, also uh, the basis of the uh, nuclear bomb. It's the basis of <laughs> a lot of stuff. Yeah. Definitely the nuclear bomb, and we can talk about that a, a bit if you'd like, but uh, it is it, the thing which makes it interesting is something that uh, uh, comes up when you realize what quantum field theory is saying, the thing which makes it interesting is that matter itself is nothing but some kind of condensed energy. Mm -hmm. And that matter itself is not kind of quote unquote real, but it comes about through some kind of mixture of quantum fields. In fact, uh, the Large Hadron Collider in, uh, built by CERN in Switzerland yes primary purpose was to find out how that mixture was taking place. Because mm. what we physicists, quantum field theorists now believe is that there is no inherent matter. What there is is just a mechanism by which something gains the appearance of matter mm. through the interaction of something called a Higgs field, okay. which uh, interacts and produces uh, a matter field. Okay. It's, a, it's a very interesting concept. We can maybe get into that if you want later. Well, well it sounds uh, very technical yes. to me. And I know there was a lot of talk recently about the Higgs boson and right. the so-called God particle, or That's right. some people call it the goddamn particle, right. I think. But uh, in, in any case, what y your, your point is that matter itself is a condensed form of energy. It, it is, it, that's a, a one way to look at it. Uh, I don't quite use that terminology. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I see 
is that matter is a it it arises from fields interacting, mm-hmm. and these fields themselves are not material; they're ethereal in yeah. some way, probabilistic they're, fields. Uh, yes, they're all over the place, but they're they're fields. Yes. Uh, and if you if you want to get a picture of what a field looks like, if you ever have watched a field of grain when the wind is blowing mm-hmm. and you see how it moves the waves move the 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 uh, the, the fields of grain back mm-hmm. and forth that's a kind of a metaphorical picture of what we mean by a field it's something which fills the whole space mm-hmm. and the wind is kind of the the field itself you don't actually see the wind you just see how what its effect is on the fields of grain well and most of the viewers who are watching this video at uh, at, at the moment when they're watching it not the moment when we're recording it are yeah. uh, able to hear us and see us by by virtue of electromagnetic fields. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And the electromagnetic field is one which uh, uh, has been studied so thoroughly yeah. that we began to formulate a theory, a field theory, called quantum electrodynamics, yeah. which is the interrelationship or interaction between electrons and light. Mm-hmm. And out of that came a remarkable insight which was called the fundamentals of quantum field theory which was then extended well into the subnuclear domain which is the field of quarks and whatnot and it as soon as you got out of light and electrons and you got into this minuscule quarkian world it became so complicated and there were many sweepings under the rug mm. of infinities which came to keep <laughs> cropping up yeah. and uh, we're still playing with that. Well one of the important insights I gather is is that consciousness has a role here in determining how these fields manifest themselves. It definitely does and this is an insight which I in saying this, I'm sort of putting myself uh, into the realm of, of great speculation, but uh, I think that uh, without consciousness, the whole notion of time would not even occur. Mm-hmm. And so you wouldn't have all of the basic symmetries which arise uh, through uh, time itself being one of these kinds of symmetries and that it comes about through consciousness itself and as the consciousness is a form of field uh, it's not a form of field it's it's kind of like Aleph itself that Aleph is is a form of consciousness which includes unconsciousness now, Aleph is a mystical letter in a it's way a mystical and letter and it, it seems to be the best l- description uh, of what this field is like I, I it's hard to define because the minute you start talking about it in terms of humanic human terms, it becomes not only mystical, but it becomes metaphorical. And the problem is the mathematical structures of even quantum field theory don't allow you to always stretch into metaphor. They uh, they seem to be uh, troubling mm-hmm. for scientists to try to make metaphors out yeah. of the out of the concepts. That's why yeah, sometimes you hear the mantra in physics, shut up and calculate. Don't. That's, that's exactly, shut up and calculate, because if you try to think about these things too much, you're going to be off into the wood, in the uga, in, in, into the weirdo uh, <laughs> stuff. And, uh, but there are similar restrictions around Kabbalah. It's, uh, as I understand it, in the traditional Jewish communities, one was not supposed to even begin studying Kabbalah until you were at least 40 years old. Yes, that is interesting. And I, I understand that the, is that some people, that women were not supposed to study this <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that's old prejudicial thinking. Sure. I don't think that has really anything to do with the Kabbalah itself. Because Kabbalah is a study of the meaning of the Hebrew letters mm-hmm. and their pronunciation. And in studying Kabbalah, one evokes the feeling mode, the feeling tone, the intuition becomes uh, evoked. Your thinking is changed. Your ability to sense the world Mm -hmm. around you is changed. So these various modes of which we call 
being a human being, thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuiting, those are the primary modes about which we function on the world, uh, they all get enhanced, changed, reformed, transformed as a result of understanding some of the implications that Kabbalistic thinking implies. Mm -hmm. Well, I gather one uh, of the approaches of Kabbalah when they say, "In God said, let there be light, and there was light, it's the idea of the, the spoken word having a certain power. Exactly. Exactly. And this is another interesting parallel that I want to draw here. The Hebrew word for word is out. It's spelled Aleph Vav Tav, or in English it'd be A U. T, mm -hmm. uh, like O-U-T, but A-U-T. And when you look at what that means, Kabbalistic thinking, you have the spiritual, Aleph, disseminating, giving birth to uh, possibilities itself, but ending in Tav, which is the final letter of the Hebrew Aleph bait, and it means cosmic resistance. It's the wall by which you don't go. Mm -hmm. So what does that do wall do? It reflects it back. Yep. So you have the word is a reflection back of the spiritual dissemination. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we can make words is the reflection back. It's our way of dealing with the dissemination from Aleph. So that's what the word is. In other words, every word has a certain spiritual power embedded in it. Not it, it absolutely does, but in the English language and, and the so-called descriptive languages, that that's lost. Mm -hmm. It's only in these other kinds of languages, but what I called what Suarez called projective languages, where projection from the word into mm -hmm. the various feeling, thinking, intuiting, sensing tones become important. And the Kabbalist masters knew this. Um, he certainly, Suarez certainly knew it. Um, and it's it's just it's it's lost. And maybe some of the ancient Sanskrit also had this ability of each letter being a word. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. I've never really studied Sanskrit or sacred languages in sacred general. Sacred languages in general. Yes. Yeah. Native American may have this as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, interviewed a, a Kabbalistic thinker, you know, Stan Turum, who right. believes that every letter had it was sort of like a dance gesture, yes. a hand movement associated with each of the Hebrew letters. Yes, yes, I know. I know. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, thing he's come up with. It's his own discovery, and it's, a, it, 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 it's brilliant in a way. Mm -hmm. But now back to the idea of uh, basically the quest of humans on a spiritual quest is to take our material being, our, our, ourselves, and, and elevate ourselves back up to spirit. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason that matter is here. Yeah. There's a reason for having material mm -hmm. existence. Mm -hmm. And the reason is to not necessarily give it back to Aleph, but to embody Aleph within it. Mm -hmm. um, Suarez called it the war with time. Mm -hmm. And since time is also consciousness, you might call it the war with consciousness. Mm -hmm. That we're, in a sense, battling, that consciousness is a field of battle that is going on. That's why there's so much chaos. negativity, <laughs> chaos, yeah. insanity, mm -hmm. uh, people saying things that seem totally ridiculous, evoking all kinds of emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, these are parts of the battle which come out. And so the whole point of this war with consciousness is to begin to use words that can give a victor in the battle, but not a victor in the sense of killing the other, but a victor in the sense of giving meaning mm -hmm. so that one understands where the war, why, how the battlefield got drawn in the first place. This is an old story. It's in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's the same story that was told when uh, uh, Krishna appeared to uh, the, the king um, 
uh, I can't remember his name. Arjuna. Arjuna. Yes. Arjuna. When Krishna came the to warrior. Arjuna, the warrior. The warrior. Arjuna king, yes. had a. He's had this war with conscience. He has to go to battle with his family on the other side of yeah. whatever it was, and Krishna assures him that that is you know that battle has been fought and over and over again. Don't worry about it. Uh, think of be be involved with Krishna. And Arjuna says, "What does that mean?" And then suddenly Krishna appears to him as a thousand billion faces brighter than a thousand suns. Yes. And what Arjuna notices is that many of those faces are the faces of Arjuna. Mm -hmm. So Krishna is telling Arjuna, "You are Krishna too." So, and what you're saying is then that the mystical teachings of Kabbalah are similar to the mystical teachings of Hinduism. I think there's a great tie there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, more than I think either side is willing to admit. <laughs> well, I've it. sometimes heard it said that Abraham and Brahma are, are I, related. I, I, I think <laughs> Suarez also mentioned that, by the yeah. way. He uh -huh. thinks there's definitely a race there. And I'm convinced of it because uh, I've spent a lot of time in India. I've mm -hmm. been, been made four trips there. Uh, I was with the Dalai Lama the last time he, w he invited a bunch of uh, so-called mystical in, scientists. I don't know. We, I don't. I don't know what what why we were chosen, but certain yeah. num numbers of us were chosen. Uh, Gene Houston, I think, was there. A uh, uh, number of other luminaries in the in the field uh, were there, and I was invited to go along and uh, uh, to meet with to meet with him. And I I I just noticed certain similarities between mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of argumentation that is used in the teaching mm -hmm. of the Buddhist ideas. They argue the ideas, yes. like in uh, a, a school, mm -hmm. like in a Hebrew school, <coughs> or a school where you're learning the mysticism, uh, yesh yeshiva, whatever that well, is. Well, I suppose when philosophers of all cultures come together they they begin to argue these points and I think so it's a big part of Jewish tradition of course but I one finds it in Vedanta and yes in Buddhism as well yes definitely yeah. and, and and that parallel uh, uh, definitely was something I, mm -hmm. I I noticed there anyway um, when I talk with uh, uh, Indian philosophers uh, about various things, uh, they resonate with the idea of Kabbalah. They don't find that foreign to them at mm -hmm. all. They it kind of makes. How sense do they that. relate to the notion that you write about matter into feeling? Well, uh, I haven't really found out how they relate to that matter into feeling. I thought would be a natural extension of mind into matter, and that mm -hmm. would uh, immediately garner a lot more attention because I go into more detail about the sensation, uh, feeling, intuition, mm -hmm. uh, thinking, how those all arise and how uh, even how space and time and matter get generated yeah. from the, fr rather than the saying as modern science tend to do, that the subjective tones mm -hmm. are arising from the materialistic objective tones right. of the world. For example, thinking is nothing more than neural m meanderings in yes. the brain yes. and so forth. Uh, this takes a, a counter. It says that the subjective elements, feeling, intuiting, thinking, uh -huh. and sensing, are the generators of space, time, matter, they and energy. They come first. First, the primary mm -hmm. is feeling, thinking, intuiting, yep. and sensing. And then you can show by certain combinations from these various mm -hmm. primary modes how space, time, mm -hmm. momentum, energy get generated. In other words, that's your resolution of the mind-body problem. My resolution of the mind-body problem is very simple. Mind is first, matter comes second. Mm -hmm. And that resonates very strongly with the Hindu tradition. Yes, it does. Yeah. So when I came up with this, I didn't know the Hindu tradition, but now when I speak to Hindus about it, they mm -hmm. resonate with this idea. Mm -hmm. Well, otherwise you're stuck in this paradox, which has, has been the bane of Western philosophers for thousands of years. How can inert 
matter that possesses no consciousness of its own, according to all of our physical theories, how, how can it be that we, cre material creatures, have consciousness, have feelings, have thoughts? Right. It's, it's a great mystery, unless you uh, find a resolution such as the one you've come up with. Yes. When I wrote a book, the, the book that I wrote, The Dreaming Universe, I introduced it by saying, well, if the materialists are right, then how do you explain how meat dreams? Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's as ridiculous as you could possibly think, but there is the whole materialist conundrum yeah. in a knot. Well, you know, I did an interview with a prominent materialist, Marvin Minsky, one oh, of yes. the pioneer computer scientists and a brilliant man. Brilliant, and, brilliant and, guy. And uh, he looked at me and he said, You should be proud of being meat. <laughs> 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 That's wonderful. <laughs> then I wonder, how is it that meat can experience pride? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. That's the question. The question, again, is which is fundamental? And one of the problems that I think will be approached more definitely in the next hundred years is the whole problem of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a primary thing that needs to be studied, yes. it needs to be understood better, mm -hmm. it may even help us get rid of uh, many of the social and psychological problems which seem to be arising in culture. Mm -hmm. uh, if we understood better what the subjective experience is like, if we understood from behavioral characteristics why human beings mm -hmm. think into it, sense, and feel mm. the ways they do. Well, Fred Allen Wolf, what a pleasure sharing another half hour with you. You really you exemplify in, in your discussion why a person such as yourself, a quantum physicist, would turn to Jewish mysticism, to Kabbalah, to seek certain answers. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for being with us.